Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of the Monday Night Review. I had a pretty epic week last week, don't want to show off, but I did go and see Bruce Springsteen. My friend was supporting them and phoned me up on the day before, phoned me up on Wednesday and said, do you want to have backstage guest list things? So off I went on Thursday and saw um, just a lovely sunny show in Hyde Park. It was absolutely wonderful. And then my friend took me out to the pig for lunch on Friday. I am going to be 40 this year, so uh, everyone's being extra nice to me, which is which is lovely. So Bruce brings me in on Thursday, uh, the pig for dinner on Friday, and then um, mountains and mountains and mountains of washing for the rest of my life. <laughs> Two days of missing stuff, and I'm severely paying catch up. I also went to uh, a jazz, a night of jazz at the place where I work, the Grange Festival. I help out with their social media and they did uh, two nights of jazz called Ellington from Stride to Strings. And I am a massive Duke Ellington fan. Can you tell from the intro music? It's Duke Ellington. And uh, so to see, for me, to see the Mooch played live, absolutely dreamy it was such a good night and I got to wear sequins I did a complete mum transformation where I took my kids to Paulson's Park during the day and then had seven minutes to get changed so just whacked on a jumpsuit some bright lipstick and some sequins and off I went so I've had a pretty good week of it I'm not gonna lie but my baby turned six my littlest my littlest baby turned six not so much of a baby anymore I hope everyone is well uh, I've received some lovely emails. Your emails make me smile. Also, just uh, I love a recommendation. Love a recommendation that also tells me where to find the best info because I will lose hours of my life down wormholes if I'm not fully focused on in on something. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, so today's episode comes from watching a, a TV show that I think is new. It might not be new. It's called When Missing Turns to Murder. It's so far ha- is all UK based, which is quite nice because quite often these very good true crime uh, documentaries are American, which is lovely. But we miss out here in the UK on hearing about some really important stories. And the one that we watched first just horrified me and my husband so much and I decided to do it for this week's episode. I often do do older cases because I mean who doesn't love Victorian history and that kind of thing and and quite often those older cases will be really influential on modern day laws or it's just interesting. My uh, I, I come from a family who's deeply into history so for me it, it's part of the history of these cases that intrigues me but also if you do a more recent case if there are people still living who were involved then that can be you know I don't want to upset people I don't want to to cause them further anguish so there's lots of reasons why I do which cases I do but this one is recent but it's also incredibly relevant and there's actually an action you can take at the end of this story which I'm going to tell you about it comes with a trigger warning. This is upsetting content, so listener discretion is advised. It's it's um, domestic violence, stalking, control. So I absolutely understand if you find that difficult that you might want to skip this. But I do think in terms, it, this is a UK case. And one of the things I wanted to do when I started this podcast was not only cover the really well-known crimes but also try and focus on the ones here in the UK that maybe don't get talked about but also for those of us in the UK that this is just hugely relevant to our laws and our legal system my sources today are the Joanna Simpson Foundation the Crime Analyst podcast various newspapers there's there's lots of articles on this including a recent article in The Guardian by Anna Moore. There's, there's a lot of information on this. 
but quite a lot of the media reports at the time have quite skewed, which we'll talk about. Today we're going to talk about the murder of Joanna Simpson. Joanna Simpson was born on the 6th of May 1964 and her mother describes her as, quote, the most perfect baby, rarely cried, usually smiling and ate everything that was put in front of her. When she was 10, the family moved to the Isle of Man, where she settled in well, making lots of friends and doing really well at school. She was popular, she was kind, she was outgoing. She went to Bath University where she got a degree in business management and then she went to work as the European European marketing manager for a US computing company. Though her parents would divorce, they remained very close, good friends and parented together, her, uh, but Joe and her younger brother James. And Joe met her first husband through a mutual friend and her parents loved him. He was part of the family. And Joe's father had bought her a house in Ascot, I believe. And so the house is in Joe's name, but they move into it. And it's when they move in, it was so dilapidated. There was a tree growing up inside the house. It was in terrible shape, but they transformed it together. It was this project of love. They've made they made this beautiful home, beautiful garden. But sadly, the marriage broke down. There was nothing nasty involved. It just didn't go the distance and they amicably divorce. Jo had many hobbies, cake decorating, sewing. She always put others before herself and was bursting with energy. She loved her friends and people and she was incredibly close to her mother. She would, They would chat several times a day. And she seems, when you see people talking about Jo, lots of people are like we we chatted she seems to just be such a people person chatting to her friends daily a couple of times a day um just a real people person so she's feeling sad after the breakup of her marriage understandably and a friend of hers who worked for an airline suggested that they go to South Africa I believe they could get either discounted tickets or free tickets or whatever and they go off to South Africa and it's here that she meets Robert Brown who was the co-pilot of the plane they flew out on and he sweeps her off her feet he's incredibly charming and attentive he's a pilot and they start a relationship but when she takes Robert Brown to meet her family they are instantly concerned Diane, Joe's mother, described him as cold, full of his own importance and just interested in himself. When they left after that initial visit, Joe's father said, there's going to be trouble. They couldn't understand what Joe saw in him. He just, the warning bells were going off all over the place. And I find it really surprising because one thing that I've found really difficult when I've had boyfriends that my parents are not that keen on is it's not a comfortable feeling. This didn't seem to put Joe off at all. Um, and one friend suggests that perhaps it was a case of timing. Joe, we know, was really desperate to have children. I really don't often like to talk about that kind of thing very much because not all women are desperate to have children and I don't really like the idea of the biological clock even though it is a f obviously a factor for a lot of people but Jo that was a real life goal of hers she wanted to have children and she was 34 she'd obviously just got a divorce if you want children and you get married obviously children are part of that plan and it must feel really uh, difficult to start over again so she wants children she's swept off her feet by Robert and within about six months they get married Joe is a really hard worker she is wealthy she's worked hard she is wealthy through her family and she has this beautiful home she is a real catch as far as Robert Brown is concerned she has it all now initially 
he probably seemed so as well. This charming airline pilot within six months, she wasn't probably, you know, maybe she just thought her parents were wrong. He's he seems like the real deal. But Joe speaks to her mother while she was with Brown on their honeymoon and said she had made a terrible mistake. She saw his true colours. He didn't even seem to bother to keep it up during the honeymoon. He was just rude to staff, not particularly nice to her and clearly not the man she thought she'd married. But she gets pregnant very quickly and decides to stay and make the best of it. She is someone described as a, a very positive person who would make the best out of any situation. And that's what she set out to do with her marriage. I, I would think that the fact that he is a pilot for for long haul flights is also a factor. Um, there are going to be times when he's away. So that may actually help if you think, oh, this isn't ideal, but I'm having a baby. You know, he's not going to be at the house all the time. Um, and they would have two children close together. And Brown, by all accounts, is a very hands-on father who loves his children. But both times when Diane visits her daughter after the births of the children, the first one, I believe, is an emergency C-section, which is obviously very stressful, long recovery time, first-time mum, all of that. You, I wanted my mum there. You do want someone to help you and she said she was made to feel incredibly unwelcome he wouldn't sit with her he wouldn't sit with her and the daughter she she just he'd either go running or he'd be upstairs in his study even when his mother came to stay he wouldn't sit down and socialize joe was very isolated all the time she was lonely he would constantly be belittling her and putting her down he would even do it in front of people and it's basically classic gaslighting where it sounds like if you took one incident, if it would sound trivial, but this constant picking at her confidence and her self-esteem and the things that she loved, you know, if you, if by all accounts, she was an absolutely fantastic cook. But if someone is constantly telling you that the food you've prepared isn't nice, it's going to wear you down also remember she is a people person she's very sociable she's great with people so for someone to be the the exact opposite and to not make people feel welcome in your home must be a very horrible feeling and when she has friends around he's he's rude to them she's invited them into the house and he would undermine her in front of them he would never sit with them um and we all know people who can cause a massive atmosphere and I think he would just, she would have this sort of wonderful, lovely atmosphere in the house where people felt welcomed and people wanted to be. And he would arrive and make it feel the opposite. Hetty Barkworth, Nanton met Joe when their children went to nursery together and they instantly hit it off. She describes Joe as vibrant a great friend a natural leader an amazing cook natural host brilliant at organizing parties she had a quote unparalleled ability to live for today and hesi tells a lovely story about how joe was once at a lock-in with the landlord from a local pub and she wins a piano off him playing poker and for whatever reason she decides she's taking that piano right now and so she's wheeling it through the village at two in the morning to get this piano back into her house. She just has this endless energy, a wicked sense of humour, selfless beyond belief, and her children were her life. She's a passionate gardener. She just seems to have this homemaking ability, you know, all the things that a lot of us who have children or who have homes to look after struggle with I struggle with it I have an image of in my head of what I would like but it doesn't come out that way but she just seems to be able to create these beautiful environments for people Robert Brown would come across as surly not engaged or interested in anyone else and yeah the complete opposite of Joe and doesn't seem to appreciate that she's created this lovely 
environment for him either, which I would found bloody annoying. So in order to be home with the children, and obviously Brown is a long haul pilot, so he is going to be leaving at different hours away for a long time and coming back at different hours. So you do sort of need one parent who's going to be able to be present for the children. She turns their house into a successful five-star bed and breakfast business. And this is basically an instant success. And she is given a gold award by the tourist board. And it's no surprise, really. She It brings together all the things she loves to do and excels at cooking, home deck you know interiors making this lovely environment making people feel um looked after and nurtured and cared for but rob's behavior meanwhile brown's behavior was becoming more and more hostile he's doing these long-haul flights but he would analyze the burglar alarm to tell what she'd been doing when she'd been going in and out but he also knew that when she went to bed with the children she would put the burglar alarm on downstairs and so he'd know what time she went to bed and he would ask her questions on what she'd been doing joe and hesse themselves actually found receipts for a tracking device that he'd bought to put on her car they never found the device and other sort of listening devices for inside the house. In February, I believe it's 2007, he calls home from Hong Kong saying that he's distressed and having thoughts of killing her and the children with an axe. Hesse was there when she received this call and Joe was understandably really upset. I believe that Joe then phoned another friend at the airline who was with Brown just to see how Brown was. And apparently he was absolutely fine. He was out and about chatting. And obviously I know that you can mask mental health. But from what we can tell from Brown, this was another way of controlling his wife. One of Joe's friends was out in Windsor Great Park one day near where they live with her children and she saw Brown. He was there on his bicycle and he had ridden straight at them, veering off at the very last minute to, and was terrifying enough that the friend actually went to the police to file a complaint about him. This same friend was with Joe on the 17th of July 2007. They'd spent the day together with the children during the school holidays and Joe got home about 10 p.m. and put the children to bed and when she comes downstairs, Brown corners her in the kitchen with a kitchen knife. He takes hold of her neck from behind and presses the knife into her chest. She said his eyes were just cold and black and she remembered hearing somewhere that you have to engage with your attacker and and get them to think about something that they love so she said to him what will happen to the children if you kill me and he replied you'll be dead and I'll be in prison and he lets her go but as he leaves the kitchen it's very interesting the different ways that that different mental types different different brain types deal with responses to this because quite often abusers will then be upset you know about what they've done in a, as a way to make the uh, abused feel sorry for them and feel like it's their responsibility but he says to her i assume you're going to call the police and ruin my career and again This is showing a how just self-obsessed he is, but also he's manipulating her because she he is, you know, part of the the responsible parent for her children. She doesn't want him to lose his job. You know, it's just so controlling. So she doesn't call the police. She calls her friend Belinda and says I you know I need you to come now and Belinda arrives in I think she arrives about two o'clock in the morning and and Joe's there in her pajamas and they luckily the way the house is laid out 
she can be in a separate part of the house where the children are sleeping with Belinda and they can lock themselves in so that he can't get to them at night. So the next morning, Joe rings her mother to tell her about the attack. And her mother says, you've got to bring the children here. You need to get out. And Joe is too scared to even go into the other part of the house to get the suitcases. So her brother James dashes down from London. He persuades Brown to let them take their suitcases and he helps them get to the airport, uh, get to the airport. And they go, Joe and the children go to the Isle of Man to her mother. While she's there, Diane overhears Brown tell Joe on the phone, quote, if you tell anyone what happened, it will be the worst for you. So Joe makes the decision that he has to move out. This has gone too far. It's a huge decision. It's an amazing decision to have made because obviously he's done all of this horrible behavior. But this is a real act of violence, the attack with the knife. But a lot of women wouldn't feel like they could end the relationship. And she's had enough. She says, you've got to move out. And her family is so concerned that they hired a bodyguard to look after her when she went back to the house. And she then takes out a non-molestation injunction against him, which requires Brown to stay away from the house for six months. And this is then extended to another six months. And to do this, Joe has to talk about why she wants this injunction. So there is a, a log of his controlling behavior. Joe also has CCTV installed in and outside the house, but the wires keep getting cut, as do the wires for the security lights. The, nobody seems to find this worrying. Nobody in authority seems to find this worrying. Of course, we know the only person who is going to be cutting these security cameras and lights is Brown. There's no forced entry. There's no, you know, it's not the security lights and cameras wires were cut and then there was a break in. They're just repeatedly cut over and over. Now, why would Brown want the CCTV in the house to not work? Joe starts divorce proceedings. Now, she's the main carer for the children and he would have time with them. They seem to sp sort of split weekends, half terms, that kind of thing. Now, whilst he had them, he would find out the new burglar alarm code from them. If, if Joe changed the code for the burglar alarm, he would wheedle it out of the children and then he would go into the house, use the burglar alarm code and look through her private papers, see what letters she had from her legal team and all of that. And then in 2009 or 2010, a neighbour actually saw him running across the garden in a way that he knew wouldn't be picked up by any security cameras. But they were quite a new neighbour, so they didn't know who this was, so they phoned the police. Police said to Joe that unless he was causing her physical harm, they couldn't do anything and it wasn't technically breaking and entering because he was using the code for the burglar alarm and it didn't matter that she didn't want him to have the code and he was getting the code from his seven and eight year old kids or eight and nine year old kids you know it doesn't matter that he's getting it through nefarious means the fact that he has the code means it's not breaking and entering now joe's friends and families are really hopeful brown gets a new girlfriend and they really hope that this means his attention will move on from joe but the controlling stalking behavior continued he'd often be seen sitting at the top of the driveway in his car just watching her when he had to submit his card statements to the solicitors as part of the ongoing court case, he had to, to you know, tell them what all these pay costs were and he had to admit to the tracking devices that he'd purchased. He would send her texts basically to show her that he knew where she'd been or what she'd be doing, which he wouldn't know if he hadn't been stalking her. 
And throughout all of this, they're going through this sort of horrible court divorce because Joe wanted to give him a payoff. Brown wants to go through court despite the house being in Joe's name and it being in Joe's name in her previous marriage. And her father sensibly had ensured they signed a prenuptial agreement. He, Brown wanted his fair share and he wanted to win. He would say, quote, parity is the route to happiness. So he wasn't content with the payout. He wanted half. So even though he had knowingly signed a prenuptial agreement, he believed he was entitled to half. And this was how he was going to win. You know, they hadn't come into things equally. But he has this mentality of I will win at all costs. And it's when he's looking like he, it, he's not actually going to win that things really escalate. He finds out that he's not going to win um, and it comes to a head and he makes a plan, a plan where he will win, essentially. So in April 2010, they have a, it's what's supposed to be their final divorce hearing. But the judge on their case was working on the Radmacher Grantino case which and said that until the outcome for that had been decided, he couldn't make a ruling on their case. He said to Brown, quote, if they lose, you lose, and urged him to settle out of court. As a result of the Radmacher Granatino case, the Supreme Court ruled that both pre and post nuptial agreements have, quote, magnetic importance and spouses should be held to them unless it can be demonstrated that they are unfair in how they were created or the effect they would have. So basically, prenup and a postnup are legally binding unless, I guess, they were misled um, in signing them or they could prove that they signed it under duress or unknowingly or whatever. So Brown is going to lose. His prenup is going to hold up and stand up in court. And immediately after this, he stops engaging with his solicitor and Hetty believes that it's now he started to come up with his contingency plan because he needed to win. He's found out he's going to lose. So what is his plan B? On the 31st of October 2010, about one week before their final divorce court hearing, 46-year-old Joe is at home and Brown has had the children for the second week of half term and he's dropping them home. Usually Joe would ensure that someone was in the house with her when he dropped them off. But the week previously, she had had B&B guests staying and he'd come in shouting and raging and the guests had been really upset. So she kind of wanted to avoid that situation again. And remember, he's not really supposed to. I don't think the the molestation uh, situation was still in place, but he's not really supposed to be coming to the house or coming into the house. So the children are due back at 4 p.m., and they go straight into the family room and Brown enters the house, which he's not supposed to do. Unbeknownst to Joe, he has hidden a claw hammer covered in masking tape in one of the children's homework ban- bags. He then hits Joe 14 times over the head with the hammer, causing over 38 wounds. Her daughter, who was 10 at the time, would later tell Diane that she could hear the bang, bang, bang of the hammer hitting her mother. The children can hear what's going on. They're upset. Um, Brown tells the daughter to go upstairs and their son, who's still downstairs, is told to stay in the living room. The police would later find an imprint of the son's foot in blood on the floor. So this did not happen while the kids were distracted and didn't know what was going on. They absolutely knew what was happening. and. Her son has never really spoken of that night to anyone. They are now adults. The daughter will talk about it. Her, the son does not. Brown returns. Uh, Brown carries Joe to the back of the car, wraps her in a plastic sheet that he has in there in the boot. Both children see this happen out of the window. Brown then returns and pulls out the CCTV cables and the phone lines and police believe he was going to leave the children on their own. But for some reason, I think because they'd been watching out the window, he changed his mind. He was due to fly to Lagos the next day. And in court later, he would say that he 
decided he would rather crash the plane killing all the passengers than go to prison. So this gives you, you know, again, completely self-involved, happy to kill a plane load of people just to save his own skin. So he changes his mind. He puts the kids in the car. Joe's son says, are you taking mommy to hospital? To which he doesn't reply. He drives them to his house and leaves them with his girlfriend, who is five months pregnant at the time, telling her that Joe is unwell. And so he's brought the kids back. He then takes Joe's body to Windsor Park and buries her. He returns home in the early morning and though he's supposed to be flying to Lagos the next day, his girlfriend persuades him not to go. Whether she knows what's happened or suspects something isn't right, we don't know. Then on the 1st of November, police receive a sinister phone call from Robert Brown saying he wants to come in to speak to someone about a domestic violence incident. The call handler, I have to say, I think does a really good job. Um, I'm going to quote some of the call, but she handles it incredibly well so brown says i'd like to make an appointment to come in regarding an incident that occurred yesterday can i ask what the incident was a domestic issue she then explains that she'll need to take some of his details and he says it's a serious domestic the call handler says that then the policy is for someone to attend within the hour and he says i'd rather come to the police station as i've got children here when asked for the information on the incident he says his lawyer has advised him not to say anything she says why have you been given that advice why have you been speaking to a lawyer and he says because it's quote of a serious nature she pushes as to what this is which i just think is really impressive i would have been like oh okay and be sort of trying to think about what to do next she says you know what do you mean he says he's rather not say. she says why not this is confidential between you and me no one else will know and he stammers a bit and says it's of an extremely serious nature she asks if both parties are okay neither of you are harmed are you she says he replies well one person is she checks on the welfare of the children which is great and says i'm assuming you are worried about the consequences and he says yes bravo to that woman she does not give up she doesn't sound judgmental she clearly i think i don't know what point she works out that he's possibly murdered his ex-wife but her tone of voice does not change she sounds bright and breezy professional um not shocked and she does what needs to be done she gets a lot of information out of him But one thing that's also very noticeable here is he is very calm. He's in control. He's collected. He doesn't seem upset. He doesn't show any remorse. He wants to make an appointment. And there's two things that really surprise me about this. He wants to make an appointment. I don't personally know, but I know of someone who my family knows who murdered somebody and immediately took themselves to the police station actually took themselves to a couple of police stations because they were closed yay britain but he went to the police station and handed himself in i think if you are going to the police because you have committed murder you i mean you must be pretty sure that you can just go in i don't think you need an appointment i think you can just go in and they will see you But I kind of feel like he wants to make himself seem important. He wants to make sure that someone is there to receive him. And this is, you know, he needs, someone important needs to see him. Um, Also, what's interesting in this call is the handler says, um, is this in relation to your ex-partner? So I'm assuming this is from the non-molestation order that they've got flagged that there is obviously something on record because he doesn't say on the whole call he doesn't say you know I've incident with my ex-wife or anything like that until she says um is this relation to your ex-partner and he says yes my ex-wife so there's clearly something on the files of on his file so she says just go to your local police station and someone 
I'll send someone there to speak to you. And again, she doesn't make it sound. She doesn't say it's just very well done. I think she doesn't say just go into any police station and they'll arrest you. You know, she just says, okay, go to this. I think she says Windsor police station and I'll send someone there. You know, it just sounds like, yep, we've got your appointment. It doesn't sound at all threatening. She just does such a good job. I just wanted to flag that because I think quite often we'll be like, and then the police did nothing. Uh, I think the call handler is excellent. So after five days of questioning by the police, with Brown saying very little, it was a really touch and go because obviously they have no body. They've gone to his house. They've found the blood. They've uh, they've gone to Joe's house. They've found the blood and everything, but they have no body. And and they're really worried he's just not going to talk. But after five days of questioning, after five days of questioning by police, Brown takes them to where he has buried Joe's body. And police would say that had he not shown them where she was, they would just never have found her. It was apparent that the grave would have taken him weeks, if not months, to dig. And even worse, it was close to the place that he would take take the children to build dens while they were playing in the woods nearby their father was possibly digging a grave to put their mother in. It was six feet deep and dug to the specifications of a large plastic garden box that he had bought, put into the hole and lined with plastic. It would later be determined that he had white plastic forensic style jumpsuit, blue plastic shoe covers, ties, ropes and everything like that. Pre-bought, ready. It was also directly under the flight path for planes coming into Heathrow Airport. So it would be like he'd be able to keep an eye on her. The whole thing is just horrendous but so calculated. He had a plastic wrap in the back of the car. When he dropped the children off, he picked up the forensic suit, the shoe covers, the tape. He's pre-lined the box. The box is in the hole, ready to go. Six months later, Robert Brown is in court for the murder of, of his wife, Jo. The media referred to him as BA pilot and he was the centre of attention. It would be things like BA BA pilot kills wife and domestic and that's the basic gist of it. Everywhere, that's what I meant at the beginning of of the, the episode, everywhere you read about this, he is referred to as BA pilot. She is his wife. There, it's, there is no, it, it, do you know what I mean? It's not award-winning B&B owner killed by husband it leads very much with you know this man is a respected pillar of the community etc as we've seen it's very much not the case he i don't i don't know how he managed well i do know as we've seen that's very much not the case uh he's not a pillar of the community he's not a nice man at all but he's obviously able to turn the charm on and manipulate to get what he needs, what works best for him, etc. The pathologist told the court that Jo had sustained injuries to her hands and arms as she defended herself against the attack and suffered fractures only usually seen in road accidents. So I believe like her wrists and her arms were broken by the blows. None of this gaslighting control stalking behaviour was brought to light in the trial it wasn't thought of as those behaviors at the time you know it was it was an unhappy marriage it was a domestic incident no one mentioned this behavior joe had been working on her divorce statement the night before she died her family and friends begged the barrister who was representing joe to read it in court it was joe's chance to have a voice in this situation the barrister's response was quote Trivia, trivia, trivia. Family and friends who were witnesses at the trial were not properly prepared and were terrified to take the stand. And in fact, only two of them would. 
out of 20 witnesses that had been called, they were all cancelled. Hesse felt the prosecution were complacent. As we've seen, there's just so much evidence of premeditation that the jury would be sure to find Robert Brown guilty of murder. So the prosecution did bare minimum, absolute bare minimum. Brown spent his entire witness statement painting Joe as this sort of moneyed bitch who controlled him and controlled money, who'd had an affair, which she hadn't, and implied that she'd initially railroaded him into marriage, which the opposite was true. He was charming. He relied on his status as a BA pilot and you know, in charge of hundreds of lies daily. And he claimed that he was suffering with adjustment disorder, something that most commonly occurs in teenagers. And this adjustment disorder is very briefly discussed by two psychiatrists, one of whom backs him up and the other who says that this is, quote, a minor form of disorder and very rarely linked to violence and was not in keeping with such acts as dismantling the CCTV straight after the killing and that kind of thing. But Brown is not challenged his statement stands, he's allowed to be sort of charming and that kind of thing. And the prosecution team decide that the divorce wasn't anything to do with this case, despite it being, as we've seen, an important part of how this terrible murder came about and all the controlling aspects, the manipulation, the violence, none of that gets brought up. It's clearly not a crime of passion. It's not a flash of rage nor is it something that Brown feels remorseful about. It's not they were having a massive argument. He reached for the nearest thing and bashed her once with it. And, you know, he took a weapon into her house. Joe's character should have been presented as evidence. And yet it was only Brown who was allowed to talk about her. There were 20 character witnesses ready to take the stand on behalf of Joe. All but two were cancelled beforehand because it was assumed that this case was a no-brainer. And those who took the stand were only told that were told that they could only answer yes or no by their barrister. So they were so in the spotlight, they hadn't been properly prepared. And they couldn't speak for their loved one. A trial that should have taken six to eight weeks with the jury being taken to Joe's home to see how she tried to protect herself with CCTV and alarms and where the murder had taken place and should have seen where Brown buried her in such a secluded area with such a deep grave. They saw none of this and the trial took six days. A man who had controlled his wife to the point of killing her rather than lose a court case was allowed complete control in the courtroom and manipulated. Despite evidence of considerable planning, premeditation, he went with a pre-wrapped hammer hidden in his child's school bag. He had taken the time to dig a grave. He had a plastic sheet in the boot of his car. Robert Brown was convicted of manslaughter due to diminished responsibility because of this alleged adjustment disorder caused because the divorce was putting him under stress. Everyone was shocked. Even the judge, who commented that this adjustment disorder seemed to have mysteriously vanished straight after he murdered his wife. In May 2011, Robert Brown was given a 26-year sentence, of which, by English law, he would only have to serve half. At that time, English law would determine that a sentence for manslaughter, you were entitled to be let out halfway through. And the only thing that can stop that is if you do a criminal act while in prison. So it doesn't matter if the police think that you're a risk or if you haven't been good in prison. The law states that you have to be released. The barrister said to Diane afterwards, I'm going to go and have a large gin and tonic and forget all about your trial. Completely horrendous, absolutely horrendous. It would come to light that Joe was not the first victim of Robert Brown's psychological abuse. Another woman came forward who'd suffered coercive control at the hands of Robert Brown. And we know that people like who behave like this will continue to do so. There's also his now ex-girlfriend who has his child. There are his children with Joe, who are now adults. So many people who won't feel safe because of this man. And 
as far as we know, he will feel like he's won. He's won against Joe and he will want to continue to win. Robert Brown is due to be released after just 13 years this November 2023. Joe's friends and families are, are frightened. We have seen that he's a person who has to win whatever the cost and these people are part of his downfall. Not only have they lost a daughter, mother and friend in a brutal way, suffered a terrible miscarriage of justice, but now a man who has shown what he is capable of is going to be released. And the thing is, it only takes one slip through the cracks for the worst to happen. Hetty and Diane are working towards getting the law changed so that those who are convicted of manslaughter due to something like adjustment disorder have to have a psychiatric evaluation before they're released. If Robert Brown killed while suffering with adjustment disorder, then he, if he has it again or still has it or has it in the future, then he is still a risk. Diane also points out that the probation system here is in absolute turmoil. Who is going to be keeping tabs on Robert Brown for the next 13 years of his sentence? So that's the deal here with manslaughter. You serve half your term in prison and the other half you are under probation. But, you know, I think anyone who's had any dealing with the system knows how many holes there are. And it just takes one hole for this man to be dangerous they, they they just can't keep a tab on him and as i've said before he doesn't need long and he's had enough time to make a plan and he won't have been sitting in prison feeling remorseful and planning a better life for the way that he lives he will no doubt have been feeling wronged he he is wronged I'm going to quote from Anna Moore's Guardian article now because the facts she's pulled are absolutely horrifying. Quote, Poppy D.V. Waterhouse, 24, sustained more than 100 injuries in a slow, brutal attack by her ex-partner, Joe Atkinson. He was sentenced to life for murder with a minimum term of 15 years, 310 days. Ellie Gould, 17, was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, Thomas Griffiths. He strangled her, then stabbed her at least 13 times. His sentence life with a minimum term of 12 years and six months. For the victim's families, the injustice was clear. If these murders had taken place outside the victim's homes, the sentences would have been 10 years longer, as there are higher penalties if a killer takes a knife to the scene rather than lifts one from the kitchen drawer. And women are far more likely to be killed at home. Between 2017 and 2019, three quarters of female victims in England and Wales were murdered at home. For male victims, it was less than half. Interestingly, murder with a knife carries a 25-year sentence, but only if the offender carries the knife to the scene. Two women a week are killed by a partner or ex-partner, and these are considered as one-off random killings due to a volatile relationship, as if these women are partly to blame for their deaths. Thomas McCann murdered and dismembered his wife, Yvonne, because she forgot to freeze a bag of chips. In March 2021, he was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 12 years, 182 days. Throughout this episode, I've been using Joanna's previous surname, Simpson, because I don't think she should re be remembered by her second married name. Diana, Joe's mother, brought up the two children and credits them with saving her life. But I think to step into the role of mothering grieving children when you're already in your 70s and you have lost your daughter is incredible joe simpson is terribly missed but diane and joe's family and hetty and her friends have not been idle in their mission they're constantly campaigning for changes to the law acknowledging coercive control and overkill as mitigating factors in these cases and a review has recommended that lawyers and judges receive training around coercive control Hetty, who's now the chair for the charity Refuge, wants the creation of an automatic 25-year tariff for domestic homicides and explicit exclusion for de victims of domestic abuse and violence. So she wants women who defend themselves to also have the flexibility. At the moment, the, the treatment of domestic violence is terrible. Joe had strong moral values and believed it's important that all children should have a safe, secure and loving home. The Joanna Simpson Foundation has been set up in her memory and their work is based on her beliefs, values and the love of her children by transforming the care 
support and protection of children affected by domestic abuse and homicide. In 2022, Section 132 of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2022 gives the Secretary of State for Justice the power to stop the release of someone with a determinate sentence if there is strong evidence that they are danger to the public. Diane Hetty and I as well believe that this should be used to review the release of Robert Brown and Hetty wisely says it should be used for all cases of domestic homicide. And not just because Joe and her children deserve more than a manslaughter charge, but to keep women safe. Men like Robert Brown do not change and there is no evidence that he has received any psychiatric help in prison. He is a danger to women. The ones who helped put him behind bars and the ones he is yet to meet. He also has an ex fiance and child who have no protection. I'm going to put a link below to their website. They've got a pre designed email so you can email your MP to stop the early automatic release of Robert Brown. You can use the hashtag not another Joe if you want to talk about this. In the UK you can call the National Domestic Abuse Helpline on 0808 2000 247 or visit Women's Aid. In Australia the National Family Violence Counselling Service is on 1-800-737-732 and in the US the domestic violence hotline is 1-800-799-SAFE. Other international helplines may be found via befrienders.org so b-e-f-r-i-e-n-d-e-r-s dot org and that is the story of the murder of Joe Simpson. Quite a long one but necessary and i think what i really want to flag is how this case is the murder of a woman in her own home who has taken every precaution to protect herself and her children with court divorce proceedings um she's got close friends she's close with her family she has cctv he's not supposed to be coming into the house and she was n- not protected by the law in terms of the outcome obviously that is a jury's decision but the way that her case was handled but also the possibility that this man who i am not a psychiatrist but i believe will still be a danger to women in the future and it's just such a horrible story and from listening to friends of joe's and and her mother diane and and watching interviews with them and and diane you know that this case is diane has spoken to uh, camilla queen consort Queen Camilla, I don't know what we're supposed to call her, um, about it. You know, this this case has shocked a lot of people. And I listened to a very interesting snippet of an interview uh, with Diane speaking to Camilla and, and Camilla saying, you know, I, I it opened my eyes to this sort of thing. I don't, you know, we of course we know about domestic violence it's it's not that that we we don't know about it but this kind of complete control beyond a marriage beyond when everyone is when when the the person is seemingly doing all the right things you know filing for non molestation order signed a prenup all the right things were done and yet still this terrible thing happened I'd love to know your thoughts on this. I, there's a quote that I've talked about before, which is not a full quote. Um, it's an amalgamation of quotes from oh, the woman who wrote The Handmaid's, Handmaid's Tale. I cannot remember her name. Uh, who says, men are afraid that women will laugh at them and women are afraid that men will kill them. And it's it's just something that I feel very aware of and I, I'm constantly, I think it's partly being the mother of three boys that I am constantly trying to explain to them that you need to be an ally, I think, as a, as a 
a word that gets used a lot at the moment, but it's the same with anyone who is different to you. You need to be an ally. And I feel like this is a very good time that we can be an ally for women because, frankly, what chance did she have against a man who has brought a hammer into the house? There is no, it's not a, it's not an equal match. Um, so yes, I love to hear from you. So email me at the Monday night review at gmail.com. You can send me a message on social media at the Monday night review. You can come and check out the Patreon with its extra content, which is patreon.com slash the Monday night review. I'm going to put links below to the Joe Simpson foundation where you can email your MP, which I have done. And all the other links are going to be below. And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive. <laughs>